What does it take to forge a nation from the ashes of an empire? Imagine the vast Soviet Union, a colossal entity, dissolving, leaving room for numerous nations to sprout and take form. This is the genesis of our journey into the post-Soviet region. Post the colossal fall, the region became a fertile ground for new nations to emerge, each with its unique identity. This was not a random occurrence. Several factors played a critical role. The existing ethnic, cultural, and geographical differences that were once suppressed under the Soviet regime now became instrumental in defining the boundaries of these nations. The struggle for power, the pursuit of economic stability, and the yearning for cultural identity fueled the formation of these nations. It was a process as complex as it was fascinating, a dance of politics, economics, and culture. These newly formed nations were about to embark on a journey of self-identity and nationalism. But what was the region like before the wave of nationalism swept across? Let's take a step back in time and paint a picture of the post-Soviet region. Envision a mosaic of diverse cultures, languages, and traditions, all coexisting under the vast umbrella of the Soviet Union. Politically, the region was a monolith, with power concentrated in the hands of a few. The society was marked by a certain level of uniformity, with everyone sharing in the common struggle of daily life, irrespective of their ethnic or cultural backgrounds. Culturally, it was a vibrant tapestry of distinct identities, each thread representing a unique ethnic group, language, or tradition. Yet, despite this diversity, there was a strong sense of unity, a shared identity that transcended individual differences. This was the landscape before the rise of nationalism, a time of relative harmony amidst diversity. Then came a period that would forever change the region, the Industrial Revolution. How did the Industrial Revolution and civil rights movements shape the region's national identities? Let's delve into this. The Industrial Revolution was a transformative period in history. For the post-Soviet region, it brought about significant changes. It catalyzed urbanization and the rise of a working class. These shifts led to a new consciousness among the people, sparking the desire for civil rights and equality. Simultaneously, the civil rights movement was gaining momentum. The fight for equality and justice resonated deeply within the post-Soviet region, further strengthening the sense of national identity. People began to question their place in society and demand better treatment, leading to a stronger sense of self and nationhood. This period was instrumental in the formation of national identities. It was a time of change and growth, where societies transitioned from agrarian to industrial, and people started to view themselves as part of a larger community, a nation. This era brought about a new concept that would further shape these nations, ethnocentrism. Could ethnocentrism have been a cure against communism? Now that's a question that stirs the pot. Ethnocentrism, the belief in the inherent superiority of one's own ethnic group, played a critical role in combating communism within the post-Soviet region. With the fall of the Soviet Union, nations were left to rediscover their identities and cultural roots. They turned to ethnocentrism as a tool to foster nationalism and unity, a stark contrast to the suppressive uniformity communism had enforced. Ethnocentrism in this context was not just about superiority, but about survival, differentiation, and the reclamation of cultural identity. It served as a rallying point against the remnants of communist ideology, encouraging people to embrace their unique national identities. However, this approach was not without controversy, as it often led to tension and conflict between different ethnic groups. One idea that emerged from this era was Panslavism. What was the driving force behind Panslavism? Well, Panslavism is an ideology that emerged in the 19th century, advocating for the political and cultural unity of all Slavic people. This movement was largely a reaction to the growing influence of Western European powers and the fear of cultural assimilation. Panslavism offered a sense of unity and identity to the Slavic peoples spread across the vast expanses of Eastern Europe and Asia. It's essential to note that Panslavism wasn't just about creating a common identity, it was also about asserting political influence. In the context of the post-Soviet region, Panslavism played a crucial role in shaping national identities, often being used as a tool to justify territorial claims and political alliances. However, it's important to remember that Panslavism, like any ideology, was not universally accepted or uniformly interpreted among Slavic communities. It was, and remains, a complex and multifaceted concept, subject to differing interpretations and implementations. 
This leads us to question, is there a Slavic nation or just fragments of it? Is there truly a unified Slavic nation or are we just looking at fragments of what could have been? This question often stirs up a storm of debate. Delving into the heart of the matter, the idea of a unified Slavic nation is more of a romantic notion than a reality. The Slavic world is a mosaic, a collection of unique and distinct pieces, each with its own history, culture, and identity. The post-Soviet region is a testament to this diversity, with numerous national identities coexisting, often in a state of tension. This fragmentation isn't necessarily a cause for despair. It's a reflection of the rich tapestry that makes up the Slavic world. From the Baltic to the Balkans, the Carpathians to the Caucasus, each fragment contributes to the larger picture. They are not disjointed pieces, but parts of a whole, each adding their own flavor to the mix. One of these fragments is Ukraine. Does Ukraine exist by its own right, or is it a product of external influences? That's a question that invites a dive into the complex history of this Eastern European nation. Throughout the centuries, Ukraine has been a crossroads of cultures, empires, and ideologies, each leaving its imprint on the national identity. From the Kievan Ruses to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, from the Tsardom of Russia to the Soviet Union, Ukraine has been shaped by a myriad of external forces. Yet, it has also shaped itself. The Ukrainian language, culture, and spirit have persevered and sometimes thrived under these influences. Today, Ukraine stands as an independent nation, a testament to its resilience and determination. It is a nation that is continually evolving, finding its own path in the post-Soviet landscape. So yes, Ukraine does exist by its own right, a product of its history but also a creator of its future. Another key player in this region is Russia. And is Russia truly a homogenous nation-state? On the surface, it may seem so. Russia, after all, is the largest country in the world, spanning 11 time zones and encompassing a wide range of environments and landscapes. But when you dig a little deeper, you'll find that it's a melting pot of over 190 ethnic groups. The Russian Federation recognizes a plethora of languages, religions, and cultures, each contributing to a rich tapestry of shared and unique traditions. From the Tatars in the Volga region to the Yakuts in Siberia, the diversity within Russia is immense, challenging the notion of a homogenous nation-state. This diversity, however, has its complexities. It shapes and is shaped by political, social, and economic forces. It influences how Russia sees itself and how it is seen by the rest of the world. It's a fundamental aspect of Russia's national identity. The communism era hid many peculiarities within these nations. What peculiarities were hidden by communism within the post-Soviet region? This question takes us on a journey to uncover the unique characteristics of each nation that were suppressed by the iron fist of communism. Imagine a vibrant tapestry of cultures, languages, and traditions, each thread contributing to the rich diversity of the region. However, under communism, this tapestry was blanketed by a uniform ideology that often stifled individual expression and cultural identity. Take, for instance, the distinct folk traditions of Ukraine, the unique nomadic heritage of the Kazakhs, or the rich literary culture of Belarus, all were often overshadowed by the overarching narrative of Soviet unity. It's like a garden of diverse flowers, each with its own fragrance and color, that was expected to bloom as one. The peculiarities of these cultures, their unique identities, were largely obscured in the monochromatic landscape of communism. One group that played a major role in this era were the Bolsheviks, were the Bolsheviks truly nationalists, or were they simply power-hungry revolutionaries? This question may seem straightforward, but it's anything but. The Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, were instrumental in shaping the national identities within the post-Soviet region. They were certainly revolutionaries, driven by a desire to overthrow the existing order and establish a communist society. Yet, their relationship with nationalism is complex and multifaceted. For the Bolsheviks, Nationalism was both a tool and a challenge. On one hand, they leveraged nationalist sentiments to consolidate their power and unify diverse ethnic groups under the banner of Soviet identity. On the other hand, they had to constantly navigate the tensions and conflicts that arose from competing national aspirations. So, were the Bolsheviks nationalists? It's not a question with a clear-cut answer. What we can say is that their actions had a profound impact on the national landscape of the region, Two key figures emerged from this era, Trotsky and Stalin. Trotsky had a vision for the post-Soviet region, but what was it? 
Trotsky, unlike his contemporaries, saw a way out through permanent revolution, a global uprising of the proletariat. He believed this would dissolve national identities and unite the working class across borders. His vision, however, was met with resistance, and his influence dwindled. But Trotsky's ideas left a lasting impression, challenging the traditional concepts of nationhood and nationalism in the region. Stalin, on the other hand, had a different idea. Stalin's vision was a stark contrast to Trotsky's. But what was it? Stalin wanted to consolidate power within the Soviet Union, prioritizing internal strength and unity over international revolution. His motto, socialism in one country, reflected this inward focus. This shift not only solidified his rule, but also had profound implications for the post-Soviet region. The seeds of nationalism sown under his regime would later sprout, leading to the fragmentation of the Soviet Union. As we look towards the future, we are left with many questions. What does the future hold for the nations within the post-Soviet region? As we look ahead, we see a landscape of possibilities, shaped by the turbulent past and the complex present. The rise of nationalism has been a double-edged sword, bringing unity and identity, but also division and conflict. The future of these nations will be influenced by how they navigate this delicate balance. Will they embrace a shared Slavic identity, finding strength in unity as they did in the days of Panslavism? Or will they assert their individuality, carving out their own distinct paths as Ukraine is attempting? And what of Russia, the largest and most influential of these nations? Will it continue to assert its power, or will it find a way to coexist harmoniously with its neighbors? These questions cannot be answered definitively, but one thing is clear. The future of the post-Soviet region will be shaped by the choices these nations make today. Only time will tell how these nations will continue to evolve in the face of nationalism.